到的Welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show, and today our topic matter is on dandruff. As you know, I usually pick my subject matter based upon the people that walk in the door at our stores uh, to kind of decide what we need to do, and this seemed to be the topic of the last few weeks, dandruff. Now, uh, dandruff has a lot of different causes, but basically the symptoms are, you know, that chronic scaly type of white flakes that kind of fall off and you see it and brush it off your collar and that type of thing, particularly if you're wearing a dark suit or dark clothing. And basically what it do is, is it's a condition of an oil imbalance in the scalp Then those um, oils mix with the dead skin and they make the white flake flakes that uh, peel off the uh, top of the head, making them quite visible. Now, when we talk about that, generally your typical type of shampoos that you're going to get at your grocery store, they're not going to work. They may offer some temporary relief, but this is more of, once again, an internal problem that we need to resolve with diet, nutrition, and proper supplementation. So when we look at the causes, most of the time it's a diet that's rich in saturated fats. A lot of heavy um, beef and pork fats, saturated fats, tons of cheese. Anything that's heavily saturated is going to cause the, uh, your little uh, sebaceous glands to kind of get cloggy kind of fats. And the same kind of thing that contributes to dandruff can also contribute to acne, and oftentimes they go hand in hand. Uh, stress, trauma, or illness um, basically ch uh, changes the, how your body receives and uses fats in the body, and it produces high levels of triglycerides oftentimes. So what we see in that regard then as a result of any kind of trauma or what we call cortisol release is we'll see a difference in um, the, the skin tissues and as well the uh, scalp tissue. Overgrowth of yeast or flora imbalance caused by either excessive sugars, medications, um, or um, a, an extremely acidic type of environment that allows the yeast to grow. And literally, um, you literally get a kind of an itchy scalp all the time, scratching and trying to shed the, uh, the uh, tissues off the scalp with the yeast. Oftentimes, it'll show itself as well as eczema, too. Hormonal imbalances. Um, hormonal imbalances, particularly thyroid, can cause issues, and la progesterone as well, too, can cause issues with uh, the flaky types of scalp or very dry scalp. Alcohol consumption, that goes hand in hand with excessive amounts of sugar or carbohydrate consumption. Because remember, when you spike the blood sugars, the triglycerides rise in the bloodstream, and those are very cloggy kind of um, uh, destructive fats that obviously in the sebaceous glands build up and cause them to clog, and in turn, the body tries to rid the cells and you get the dandruff. Deficiencies in nutrients, particularly B vitamins, fatty acids, and selenium, and other uh, forms of minerals as well, too. The lack of good fats in the diet. So I usually tell people when they have dandruff, get your good fats up in your diet versus the ones that are heavily saturated. And try to get the ratio to be higher of the good fats, including walnuts, almonds, pecans, the good fats, avocados, fish, versus the beef or the french fry kind of fats. And if you have that ratio up higher, what you're going to notice is that you're not going to have that flaky kind of um, skin coming off. And the sebaceous glands actually can properly shed the skin uh, and moisturize the scalp as well so it's not so dry. 
Excessive consumption of citrus. And I know everybody says, okay, I get my vitamin C from orange juice. Yeah, you're going to get 25 to 50 milligrams of vitamin C from orange juice. Very inadequate, doesn't do you much good anyway. Your body, in order to maintain health, needs a minimum of 500 milligrams of vitamin C, preferably in a buffered form. But citrus, particularly oranges, and to some extent lemons and grapefruits, can cause an irritation and increase the risk of dandruff. Lack of alkaline vegetables and a diet too high in acids. So that would include um, your sugar, your white flour, pasta, starches, heavy saturated meat fats. And so when the pH is very acidic, your body will in turn also not produce or turn over good skin. And it's kind of that acid condition actually on the exterior of the skin that is existing in the in what you're putting in your mouth in the interior. Um, when you add in alkaline vegetables or alkaline producing foods, that actually helps normalize to some extent triglycerides and cholesterol as well, which can cause a sebaceous gland clogging. Shampoos that are not pH balanced are full of harsh chemicals. Sodium lauryl sulfate. Turn your bottle of shampoo over and see if it's got sodium lauryl sulfate, propylene glycol, chemicals that you particularly can't identify. Check it out. If it has those chemicals, it's obviously going to cause an irritation to the scalp. Now, overly drying shampoos can pull the good oils out, the good fats, and it can cause an imbalance in the uh, fatty acids in the scalp. And overly uh, um, oily types of you know, conditioners can cause a buildup and mess with the sebaceous gland as, glands as well, too. So you want shampoos that are pH balanced, sodium lauryl sulfate free, and the conditioners you want are going to have good fats in them, almond oil, sunflower oil. Look for those in your conditions versus a list of, of chemicals that you might see in your standard conditioners. Um, hair dyes. Now, I'm seeing this more and more frequently, and I notice with me, that's why you're seeing me use henna and stuff nowadays, and I'm, I'm not using chemicals on my hair, um, really can affect the pH. You know, they damage the scalp oftentimes and then affect the pH balance of the scalp, and you can end up with a chronic... Um, inflammatory problem, especially red dyes. Um, they get in the scalp and it just kind of stays there and just causes a continual irritation on the scalp. Food allergies, particularly dairy, soy, wheat, and then of course citrus. If you have any food allergies, that in turn messes with your, your overall sebaceous oil glands and makes your body overreactive, trying to shed and itch and that type of thing. And once again, that'll sometimes show itself in eczema, psoriasis, and then, of course, with dandruff. We've touched upon diet a little bit um, in our earlier discussion here on the causes, but obviously you're going to avoid all fruits that are from the citrus family. You want to restrict your carbohydrate consumption and not eating so much breads and the big old you know, bowl of rice checks or frosted corn flakes, um, and not so much yeasty bread. You know, grab the Ezekiel whole grain bread and eat a diet in which you've got an equal balance of good fats, a little bit of complex carbs, and some source of protein along with vegetables. Um, we did an earlier show on the metabolic diet, and you can refer to that on youtube.com forward slash VH film. And that gives you kind of a good diet and framework in which to go upon. Um, restrict the saturated fat consumption, particularly animal fats in meat, cheeses, pork, beef particularly. So you're going to eat leaner uh, cuts of meat when you do eat meat like uh, chicken breasts, turkey breasts, or your beans or your lentils are much more favorable sources of uh, protein that are not so high in saturated fats. Um, eat the good fats, the walnuts, almonds, pecans, the raw sunflower seeds, the raw almonds. You know, those avocados make terrific guacamole that you can eat on top of a nice taco salad, and you're going to get additional amounts of fatty acids or sunflower seeds on top of the salad, raw sunflower seeds. I mean, 10 grams of protein in a quarter cup of raw sunflower seeds, but you're also going to get good fats. Um, when we're talking about protein shakes, and I've mentioned on here proteins, and we want particularly plant-based proteins, make sure you find one that you don't have an allergen to. So whey proteins are very good sources of protein when a person doesn't have any allergens to whey, 
But if you're like me and you have sensitivities to whey or soy or wheat, just kind of what's up here I have sensitivities to, you look for uh, rice protein or hemp proteins or pea proteins as an alternative as well. When we talk about supplements, you know, it kind of goes back to good old basics. Um, 75 years ago, our food would have had an awful lot of these types of items in it already. Particularly, I would say probably these all right here would have probably been mostly in our food and part of our diet. But it is just not the case in agriculture anymore. And don't let anybody tell you, don't let a nutritionist or a doctor tell you that your food is adequate at this point. Science doesn't back that up anymore. It's not uh, nutrient dense at all. Supplementation is required in today's world with the way agriculture is. Um, I think I've given the example of the spinach crops out of the San Joaquin Valley. There were three separate crops tested a little over five years ago, and the spinach had zero nutritive value other than you know what they sprayed with the miracle grow. So bottom line is, you know, try to eat your alkali fruits and vegetables in an organic pesticide-free form but you are gonna probably need to supplement in order to get adequate amounts of nutrients for overall health. That would include a good multiple vitamin and high in B vitamins, or taking a good multi that has, and then add in extra B vitamins. Particularly in the morning, um, I mean those good, a good B50 or B100 can help increase your energy for anywhere from six to 12 hours, so it can help through a long work day. But B vitamins are oftentimes people are new, um, deficient in them since they are not in our foods or we don't eat the proper amount of foods. So good multiple high in Bs. Omega-3 fatty acids. Now you can eat fish if you know it's a cling, like a wild Alaskan low mercury fish, but um, fish or organic flax oil. And I usually, if you've got dandruff, I know the dosage seems very high, but until the dandruff is gone, I would really strongly encourage about 6,000 milligrams of the fatty acids per day. I do that anyway, just to help with joints and, and tendon and ligaments, inflammation. But that can be very helpful for dandruff, getting rid of it. And then keeping in a balance of omega-6s. Now, you can get that in walnuts, almonds, pecans, sunflower seeds, things like that. But if you aren't able to do that, do a borage oil or evening primrose oil. It helps balance the hormones but it really can clear up the skin. I, I tell you, my 21-year-old my son, we've added fish oil and borage oil just in the last few months. His skin is clear. He's got a good multiple high in Bs, extra D, extra C. He has no more breakouts, totally cleared up just by doing just what we've got on here on the top section. Um, vitamin A, until the symptoms are relieved. Add in 25,000 IUs of vitamin A. You can do that for a, a few month period of time and not worry unless you're pregnant can't do that. But that vitamin A can help clear up, uh, clear up skin tissues. Um, vitamin D. Now, the majority of Americans are vitamin D deficient, and you want a vitamin D level of at least 50 out of 100 on the scale. And so if you're below that, you need a higher dosage of vitamin D. But D can really help with a lot of skin tissue um, issues, including dandruff and psoriasis. Vitamin E aids in skin healing. And we know topical a lot of surgeons post-op will recommend vitamin E, but internally taken, vitamin E is a very strong antioxidant that aids skin healing. You can add in additional amounts of selenium or a zinc-copper combination. I'd like to see, hopefully, your good multivitamin have these in there. But if they don't, um, you can take up to 200 micrograms of selenium total when you add everything up. And it can seriously help with that dry scale condition. Um, a majority of Americans are very much selenium deficient. And remember, selenium lowers your risk of prostate cancer by 47% and breast cancer as well, too. So it's a very important mineral as an anti-cancer prevention. Um, kelp. Now, a lot of people are iodine deficient. So when we add in kelp sources, and you can get a food source or you can take it in a pill source of 1,000 to 1,500 um, milligrams a day of kelp, which is probably going to give you probably about I'd say well, you want anywhere from 500 to 1,000 micrograms of iodine in that kelp, which will really aid and abed the healing of the scalp. And then digestion issues. If you don't absorb your nutrients or you have a gallbladder out or your digestion's not all that good, 
then probiotics and enzymes can really aid the absorption of the nutrients. So if you're compromised in that way and you can't absorb a lot of the nutrients via food or supplements, adding the enzymes in in probiotics can be very helpful. Now, topical application. Everybody comes in the store and says, okay, what can I do topically that's not expensive? Well, I had already mentioned before, you can avoid all your shampoos with sodium lauryl sulfate and you're going to seek pH balanced shampoos, conditioners, always when you're looking for good hair products. Um, pine tar shampoo is a preferable alternative to like head and shoulders or those very drying types of shampoos that are out there. And you can kind of intertwine that with a little bit of olive oil shampoo. You want, you don't want to overly dry the scalp and oftentimes these types of uh, dandruff shampoos Initially, they overdry the scalp and you scrub and it goes away, but then it all comes back. So we want a nice balance and pine tar has some good research to support that it can help with that balance. Now, I love and one of my favorite ways is to take a quarter of a cup of raw Bragg's apple cider vinegar or a raw apple cider vinegar, not the one from the grocery store that you use to clean your windows, and mix it with a quart of water, you know, and rinse your scalp after shampooing. It can change the pH of the scalp and aid and abed your body's ability of getting the scalp balance. Finally, once a week, just take a little bit of olive oil or almond oil and just pour a few tablespoons or you can warm it up. It's a nice hot oil treatment and massage that into the scalp. Loosen up those flakes, nourish the scalp. Besides the nutrients on the inside, nourish it with fatty acids on the outside as well. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today we're going to talk about, since we're talking about as, as one of our, my nice little uh, producer, um, film director, person running camera, my everything bill is going back there. We're going to do something that's going to work with head and shoulders. Obviously, we talked about head and shoulders for the scalp, but here we go. Head and shoulders for headaches. And this is actually an isometric exercise that you can do while you're sitting at your desk. If you particularly notice you've had your neck down, your head down, you're starting to get that, develop a little bit of that tension headache. This is an isometric exercise that can help relieve some of that tension and hopefully get some better blood supply back into the brain. Very simple. You're just using your own resistance. And so what you're going to do is, for example, on the right side of your head, you're going to put your hand up and you're going to push up against with your neck muscles against your hand and offer resistance. Release it. Do it again. Release it. Do it again and release it. But you're going to hold it for about 10 seconds um, at each time and release it for a few seconds. And then do the other side. Release it. You know, hold it. Release it. After you do the side, then you're going to go to the front and you're going to re resist the front and release it the same way about three times. And then to the back, you're going to hold on to the head. And you're going to try and grab that area where you feel your skull is right there and maybe put your hands there, massage a little bit back that area, and then resist as well to the, the back neck muscles. When you do that, what you're doing basically is you're pumping some blood into the neck muscles and obviously the spine and all of these nice little blood vessels that feed the brain, you're going to compress it, push blood into there, and hopefully relieve some headaches and give you a little bit additional amount of energy. Next, we're going to move on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Tricciano. Ralph? And thank you for that intro. Well, to start off, let's look at artificial butter. Now, I know recently you guys have been hearing a lot about popcorn and butter flavoring in popcorn, but however, there's a substance called diacetyl, otherwise shortly known as DA. It's in more than just buttered popcorn. It's in margarine. It's in candy. It's in snack foods. It is in a ton of different things. And it has one extremely insidious effect. Now, this was researched and published recently in the Journal of Chemical Research and Toxicology. 
Now keep in mind, keyword toxicology. Well, diacetyl, the simple thing that gives a lot of things its artificial butter flavoring, they discovered past the blood brain barrier. Now the reason this is important is because they were theorizing whether diacetyl can have an effect with beta amyloid clumping. What's that mean? Alzheimer's. All right. Well, they found out this. Not only did diacetyl pass the blood-brain barrier, it deactivated a primary protein responsible for protecting the nerve fibers in the brain called glyoxylase 1. And what this does is safeguards the nerve cells. So not only did it get into your head, so to say, it also took away your brain's ability to defend itself against normal daily insults. Let's say, for example, someone's on a medication, painkiller, whatever it is. And they said basically, and they did studies they did with just a daily amount of this butter flavoring. They said in light of chronic exposure of industry workers to DA, diacetyl, the study raises the troubling possibility of long-term neurological toxic toxicity mediated by diacetyl, or this artificial butter flavoring. So, since it's not going to be removed from the market anytime soon, and you have children who are growing up, or basically pregnant mothers, and you're dealing with a neurotoxin, you better start looking at a lot of your products for artificial butter flavoring. The FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration, I should say, or the Department of Agriculture is not going to come to your aid. So until then, best to avoid it. All right, now let's look at creatine. A lot of people normally look at creatine as something that's usually used for muscle building. Well, they did an interesting study recently on creatine and with among women with major depressive disorders. Now, what they did is they did a controlled study with Lexapro. I did Lexapro and creatine, and Lexapro and a placebo. All right, I would have liked to see the study done with creatine by itself, but we get what we can get. All right, what happened is they gave women five grams of creatine with major depressive disorders for about eight weeks. And this was printed in the American Journal of Psychiatry online. What they discovered is this. The creatine, they basically theorized, worked by helping with brain energy in the production of what's called phosphocreatine. All right. So they looked at these 52 South Korean women, ages between 19 to 65, and they rated them what's called the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. This is what happened after six to eight weeks compared to the placebo group. I should say at the end of eight weeks, half of the creatine group showed no signs of depression compared with one quarter of the placebo group. That means in eight weeks, major depression, 50% of them were showing absolutely zero signs of major depression, not mild to moderate, major. And they said basically it's important because the antidepressants don't really start to work maybe until about six to eight weeks if they do at all. So when something happens that's traumatic, and basically people can't seem to get over it, or if they're on antidepressants possibly currently, and nothing seems to be happening, they may want to look at taking about five grams of creatine per day and see if it gives any additional benefit. And they said the creatine issued no side effects, and no drug interactions. Again, recently done, printed in the American Journal of Psychiatry at Lyme. And now for those who may actually need that creatine. All right, another nail in the coffin for a drug called finasteride. What's finasteride? Well, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, but you'll probably know it more as Proscar or Papacia. Proscar for basically people with prostate cancer, and Papacia for people that were taking it for balding. Well, what's this little insidious pharmaceutical doing? Well, they looked at users who were, I should say, take that back, former users of Proscar or Papacia. They had not taken the drug for at least three months. This is what they noticed. And they compared next to a placebo group. And these are people that had no depressive symptoms prior to going on the medication. They were not being treated for depression, anxiety, nothing. So they looked at it and they compared it to a placebo group. Well, I'll tell you what the placebo group results were. The placebo group basically for depression, about 10% had mild depression and 3% reported what's called suicidal thoughts. Well, the Proscar or Propatia group this is what they had. 11% had mild symptoms. Sounds pretty good. 
28% had moderate symptoms. 36% had severe symptoms. And 44%, remember, they've been off the medication for three months. And this is in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. 44% reported suicidal thoughts. You're talking close to half the individuals taking this medication that are off of it are reporting suicidal thoughts. And basically they said the potential life-threatening side effects associated with finasteride, if I'm pronouncing right, should prompt clinicians to have serious discussions with their patients if they're on the medication at all. Something really seriously to consider. And now, let's think of it this way. For the next article, let's just pretend, for example, if you use your imagination a little bit, we're in a foreign land at a different time. Let's say Nazi Germany, 1943, and you got the black and white imagery here. And all of a sudden, someone said basically that they're going to inject your uh, pregnant wife or your, basically your daughter or possibly your sister with basically something called dexamethasone. And that's what we'll call it, dexamethasone, which is kind of like a corticosteroid. But the reason you're going to inject it into your significant other is because they want to make certain that basically the baby born doesn't turn out to be a lesbian or a tomboy. Now, that's one aspect to it, but the risk to it is this. You chances are when they inject the dexamethasone, one in five of the babies are going to have a serious adverse reaction, potentially life-threatening or some sort of malformation. And if they survive the birth in utero, basically what's going to end up happening then is chances are they may have a fatal childhood cancer after that. Now imagine this. It's easy to imagine if it's Nazi Germany in 1942 because you know a lot of eugenics motions and things like that as far as genetic engineering were basically born at that time. Well, it's not. It's here and it's today. And here's the interesting aspect about it. Clinicians are doing this, and they're doing it openly. And the FDA says it's powerless to stop. Why does the FDA say it's powerless to stop pregnant women from being experimented on? On a medication that basically is designed to help cope with what's called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which people aren't going to even realize if they have, because there's no way to determine in the first trimester of the medication when they start being injected with dexamethasone. Oh, and by the way, you can look this up in the Journal of Bioethical Inquiry. It's been in the article now for two weeks. hasn't touched news once. Well, the FDA says it cannot stop advertising of this off-label use is safe for the mother and child because the advertising is done by a clini clinician and not affiliated with the drug maker. On top of that, they can't stop them from lying because the mothers are being told that this drug is safe for them and the child, even though that is not supported by any clinical evidence. In fact, the evidence is to the contrary. What they also said, too, which will blow you away, in the journal A Bioethical Inquiry, not a science fiction, is that it's actually being funded by the National Institute of Health. So here you have your Nazi Germany scenario well, your government is actually funding information to see if they can prevent your daughter from being a tomboy or lesbian as they grow up. And how is this discovered? Through the Freedom of Information Act. Something to think about, but I have to finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, do your research. And all the shows um, after they show on Comcast are on youtube.com forward slash VH film. Thank you very much.